Hey guys, Level Cap here, and today we're going to review Star Wars Battlefront. This is going to be a tricky review because we have so much fanboyism surrounding not only Star Wars films, but also the original Battlefront games. If you're not a fan of either of them, then this game is going to be a tough sell. Without question, one of the biggest appeals of Star Wars Battlefront is the artwork and absolute authenticity to the original trilogy. If you never saw episode 4, 5, and 6, then this will all be lost on you. And it will be a crying shame because it's quite possibly one of the best movie to game adaptations I have ever seen. From the audio visual standpoint, it's simply perfect. And I don't use that word a lot, but in this case it applies. Artists of Dice Stockholm team, hear me now. You are gods of the gaming industry and you have done the Star Wars franchise proud. Also, now you're screwed because you've set the bar way too high for future games. Have fun with that. A year ago, they showed us some work in progress footage of a speeder bike on Endor and it looked too real to be a representation of the actual game. No way could that have been the game engine, it had to be a pre-rendered cutscene. Nope. That shit is real. Playing Endor for the first time was like seeing Jurassic Park for the first time or watching Avatar in 3D in IMAX theaters. It simply blew my mind and shifted the paradigm of what I now know is possible for multiplayer video games. Endor is like a tech demo of what a game engine is capable of. It feels like we shouldn't be at this point where computers can render out scenery this good yet. And what's even crazier is that the PS4 and Xbox One can render it as well. Not nearly at the same resolution as PCs, but they still managed to make it breathtaking. Playing Endor on a Beast PC at 1440p resolution, on the other hand, is pretty much orgasm-inducing, and they should really put a warning on the box. I got to play Endor for the first time a week ago at an EA event myself, along with several other veteran gamers were there, and after playing Endor, Walker Assault, we all just looked at each other while trying to express our complex opinions as words. It went something like this. Dude, that was awesome. Like, I know, it was It was like so good. That was so cool, I wanna play that again, that was so cool. It was really, really, really like, like really good, dude. Now luckily I've been able to calm down since then, but I honestly still think it's an experience that every Star Wars fan should have. And if you're not a fan, it may turn you into one. Now visuals aside, the audio is great as well. DICE has never had a problem with video game audio, but from an authenticity standpoint, it's kind of amazing. Ewok trumpets sound at the beginning of an indoor battle. The blaster sounds are just like from the movies, the mechanical thudding of the ATAT -AT footsteps are unmistakable. If it wasn't for the god awful voice acting, the sound design would be 10 out of 10. It's hard when you have a franchise that so many nerds know so well that anything less than perfect simply won't cut it. Han Solo is probably the worst offender. The things I do for that princess. That unfortunate line and the hokey look of his model in general are tough to deal with, especially when overlaid on an impeccable backdrop of gaming goodness. Vader and Luke aren't much better, but I suppose I can settle for one dimple of imperfection on the face of a goddess. Too far? The ass kissing will stop in a second. We are, after all, only talking about the artwork and audio at this point. Let's change gears and address the actual game design. Casual seems to be the talk of the town when it comes to Star Wars Battlefront. No ping indicator for multiplayer games, no server browser, can only be partnered with one friend. Flight mechanics are simple as all heck. Taking down AT-ATs is a mini game. Gun mechanics are not affected by player movement, nor does aiming down sight give you an accuracy bonus. No gun customization and simplistic class customization with only two saved class setups per game. Sounds simple enough? All of these things together paint a pretty strong picture of Star Wars Battlefront being a game so casual that just about anyone can play it. Well, it is. Simply put, EA would have been stupid to make this a hardcore game that only allows the most dedicated tryhard players to succeed. Star Wars is a massive franchise, and to make this game exclusionary would be like throwing away money. Here's the thing though. Casual is the term that, although can be applied to Star Wars Battlefront, is drawing people towards an incorrect conclusion. It's more like DICE adopted a Blizzard approach to game design by simplifying the mechanics but still allowing for gameplay depth. It comes off as casual because we're not really used to seeing other game companies try this approach. I find myself doing significantly better score-wise when playing Battlefront than I do when playing games like Battlefield. 
Why? Because my skill matters in this game, a lot. You could argue that the game itself has also attracted a lower skill base than the Battlefield games do, and that is almost certainly true. But the sign of a game with no skill gap or depth would be a veteran player struggling to stay ahead of the average gamer because there are so few tools and so little depth for them to master in order to show off their expertise. Again, not something that Battlefront suffers from, at least not extensively. Now unfortunately, a lot of the other Battlefront reviews are going to miss a huge aspect of this game, and that is the end game. At the EA event I went to, there was a good mixture of veteran gamers and press. Halfway through the event, they unlocked every upgrade in the game so that we could try out all the high level weapons. The average reviewer of the game will not experience a fully ranked up server for at least several weeks after launch, if not a month. Now upon playing our first fully ranked up game, everything changed. Deaths from blaster fire went down and deaths from grenades and homing missiles went through the roof. Explosive spam became almost unbearable and gunfights became incredibly short. Now for the most part, the primary weapons that you're able to unlock at higher levels seem really well balanced and fun. Nothing seems too overpowered or unfair. However, the star cards allow you to equip numerous weapons that are game-breakingly good or allow even the worst players to get easy kills on just about anyone. Here are the biggest perpetrators and the things that not only lower the skill gap but create an unenjoyable, explosive, spammy experience. Item number one is the barrage. This grenade launcher rapid fires three grenades that detonate so quickly you don't have any time to react, especially not when you're trapped in a corridor. There's lots of corridors in this game, and corridor fighting goes from fun to complete shit once the barrage comes out. Item number two is the homing shot. This rocket launcher takes about one second to lock onto any infantry player in line of sight. Then you simply fire and forget. The missile will zero in on its target and kill it in one hit. That's right, no aiming skill required and it's nearly impossible to dodge. Occasionally an accidental jump or jetpack will afford you a near miss, but most of the time you can't react. You can hide behind cover, but that doesn't really help the guy running across the icy tundra of Hoth. Item number three is the impact grenade. Yes, they exist in real life. This doesn't mean we have to ruin our video games with them. Having someone in a game that can instantly kill you with zero time to react is annoying. It takes the skill out of a game and in case in case you were wondering, it does 100% damage if you're close enough to the blast radius. Also, it can be thrown from inside a personal shield. When you get killed by an impact grenade thrown from a dude in a bubble, you're gonna table flip, I guarantee it. Item number four is the explosive shot. Activating this star card makes your gun glow with orange electricity. When you shoot it, your shot will explode and deal way more damage for a direct hit, and it'll still deal full damage if you hit him with the splash damage. It lasts for quite a while and basically turns you into a crazy death machine, turning a burst fire gun into a single burst in your dead gun. Now imagine that every player in the game has this ability. It's not good, trust me. Item number five is the scan pulse. Don't you hate it when somebody is wall hacking in a competitive shooter? Now with scan pulse, everyone can do it. Seriously though, scan pulse is a wall hack that you can use as long as you have a charge. And get this, I wasn't even using it because explosive shot is that damn good. That's some scary shit right there that I would create a class that's more effective than wall hacking because explosive shot does so much flipping damage. Okay, so all things considered, five items being potentially game breaking isn't the worst, right? Maybe DICE will patch a lot of these items before they become game ruining issues as they have in the past. Okay, maybe not, but at least DICE is pretty good about balancing after something has been well established as ruining gameplay for at least three months. So yeah, three months in and Star Wars Battlefront may play like a dream. Now star cards aside, the gunplay is actually pretty fun. Battlefront is a perfect example of not needing overly complex gun mechanics to have a meaningful skill gap. Movement while shooting is as important as it ever has been and almost brings out an arena-like vibe at times and keeps the gameplay moving fast. There isn't much reason in the camp since it doesn't give you any aiming advantage. Using a jump pack to fly through the air and kill somebody before you hit the ground is an awesome experience and it doesn't feel out of place in Star Wars. Burst fire guns are actually fun to use. I never thought I would say those words, but they are. Finally, a video game that gets burst fire weapons right. The rate of fire during the burst is so fast that you can actually inflict massive damage in a short period of time, making them great weapons for quick peeking. 
The SE-14C Burst Fire Pistol is one of my favorite guns. They are highly skill dependent weapons, but in the right hands can be insanely lethal. Now, third person perspective is in the game, and as far as third person shooters go, Battlefront has done an amazing job. You can even switch shoulders so that you're looking from the right shoulder or the left shoulder. The only problem is that there's no way to make a truly good third person shooter without also allowing people to see around corners or over trenches without exposing themselves to fire or even being seen. It's always going to be annoying when you get killed by someone camera peeking that you had no idea was there. The first person perspective is also really well done, but unfortunately there isn't any advantage to using it and most players will eventually figure that out. I'm hoping that DICE will promote a first person only setting for searching for game servers so that we can enjoy the beautiful gun renderings from a first person's perspective without losing the tactical advantage. The same principle also applies to vehicles. Fighters and fighter squadron get zero advantage from first person mode. ATSDs and ATATs don't even have a first person mode, which is unfortunate as I was really looking forward to seeing the inside of an ATAT -AT cockpit. At the end of the day, I can and will live with Star Wars Battlefront being a game that's best played from third person mode, but I'll always carry a chip on my shoulder about it. Okay, so let's start talking about the game modes. Now, I'll admit, I just went back and deleted a whole section of this recording where I went into all the details of the different game modes and the pros and cons and stuff, and I listened to it back and it was really boring because so many of the game modes are really, really boring. I guess there's about 11 in total. Some of them are like 1v1 style game modes or play with a friend against bot game modes. There's nine multiplayer game modes. Some of them involve various forms of small scale infantry combat. The only good infantry combat one that I liked was Drop Zone. The rest of them were just kind of meh, nothing really to write home about. Then they had uh, two hero oriented game modes. I didn't really care for either of these that much. It's good for sort of getting you in and playing as the hero if if you're having a hard time finding those hero pickups on Walker Assault. But other than that, it's not going to hold your attention for that long, at least not in my opinion. Then there's Fighter Squadron, which for the most part is a novelty game mode. It looks beautiful. It's really cool the first 10 minutes that you play, and then it starts to get old because it just lacks so much depth. Admittedly, there's more depth to it than I initially thought, but not enough to keep people interested. And if you really want to play some sort of dogfighting fighter battle game, go play War Thunder or something else. There's plenty of games that do this infinitely better. Okay, so let's get to the real meat of Star Wars Battlefront. Walker Assault and Supremacy. Walker Assault is amazeballs. Giant AT-ATs walk from one end of the map to the other, while the Rebel Scum attempts to stop them by capturing and holding uplinks to coordinate Y-wing bombing runs. Fighters from both sides can be spawned in via tokens scattered throughout the battlefield, and ATSDs can be acquired by the Imperials as well. This is the all-out war that makes the game look amazing. There were multiple moments playing this mode that I just had to stop and take it all in. This coming from a seasoned battlefield player is no small statement. Not only does it beautifully recreate the Battle of Hoth in stunning accuracy, it does so with really good strategic gameplay under the hood. It also turns the Battle of Endor into something that most nerds only dreamed of and breathes life into the molten planet of Sullust. This game mode is the tits. Sure, playing hero-oriented game modes can be fun, but getting to play as Boba Fett or Darth Vader with an entire army backing you up on Walker Assault is another experience entirely. The combat is also nicely focused on the front lines. Many of the poor spawn situations have been fixed, or at least much improved since beta. Unfortunately, I believe people will still discover a lot of exploits on this game mode over time because of the complexities of the maps and spawn locations, but as long as DICE is willing to correct any of these issues as they occur, it should be good in the long run. Now, Supremacy is also a cool mode that isn't unique in design, but still a lot of fun. It's basically a tug of war on many of the same maps that Walker Assault is on, but without the walkers. Still ATSDs though. I'm guessing the Rebels just get more rocket battle pickups to combat the ATSDs or maybe more air vehicles to balance it out. There are five capture points total, but only two of them on the front lines can be captured at any one time. Both teams can capture, so whoever captures first pushes the front lines closer to the enemy base. This mode goes back and forth until one team wins by capturing all the points or by whoever has the most points once the time runs out. It's good stuff if you want something more symmetrical than Walker Assault. 
Now the hero classes have been changed since the beta. They no longer have a timer cooldown tied into their health bar. This is both good and bad. The good side is that you aren't laughably weak toward the end of your time limit. The bad side is that a good player can play very passively, especially with heroes like Boba Fett and Han Solo that can stay in the backfield sniping with their power weapons. I went on multiple 20 plus kill streaks with Boba Fett doing that. I feel the time limit may be necessary to force more aggressive play, maybe 90 seconds of play time that doesn't affect your health. One area of the game that I am really trying to like is the fact that you can only bring two loadouts or hands as they're called in game to any battle that you play once your hands are configured you can't change them until the round is over similar to call of duty except you only get two instead of five plus the additional five standard loadouts. so cod gives you 10 battlefront gives you two this may not sound like a big deal, but it can be really frustrating when you're continuously getting wrecked by air or ATSDs and you forgot to pack an ion torpedo, just like the rest of your team. Sure, there are battle pickups that can help, but it's one thing to say that on paper and another to be running for your life from an ATSD screaming profanities at dice looking for a goddamn rocket launcher. I suppose once you unlock your second hand, you should always have an anti-vehicle class there. It just doesn't give you many options if one of your classes is always anti-vehicle and the other anti-infantry. It would be nice to have more dedicated slots. Now, I actually brought this concern to a developer at the EA event, and obviously this was an intended choice. It's not like it would have been more work to allow five loadouts versus two loadouts. The rationale behind this choice was to prevent revenge killing. So you get sniped across the map on Hoth and you don't have a sniper let out. You can't then spawn back in as a sniper and take that guy out in the same manner. In a way, I like that. Everyone should have their roles and I agree with this philosophy to a certain extent. It's just hard to say, yes, this is great design when you just died for the fifth time in a row to an ATST that you can't damage. Now, maybe this won't be as big of an issue once the game launches, but they really are relying on team play to take care of problems on the battlefield. And if Battlefield, the game, has taught me anything, it's that in a random server environment, the last thing you want to do is rely on your teammates. Sorry if that sounds morbid, it's just the truth. All right, so moving on, on the aesthetic side of things, there are plenty of customization options. Tons of human and alien heads to pick from for the rebels. Even the stormtroopers can take off their helmets and show off their faces, though this has been a point of controversy, and on the nerdy Star Wars fan side of things, I'm ultimately opposed to it. Still, you can unlock scout trooper skins and even the shadow trooper. There are also more taunts than you could ever want, and you can have three of them equipped at any time, one for every situation. You can even collect a bunch of star cards for a stupid yet addicting base command game on the companion app and also collect virtual figurines based on your in-game achievements. Ultimately, there seems to be a lot of content here, but don't let all the doodads fool you. Once you trim away the fat, I'd say you're left with Walker Assault, Supremacy, and Drop Zone as being the key game modes. Maybe heroes versus villains, but that really does lean more on the novelty side than being a well-balanced game mode. Once you've narrowed down your favorite game modes and ways of playing, you may be slightly disappointed with the quantity of maps available. Four maps for Walker Assault. Five if you count the free DLC uh, that's coming very shortly after launch. Without question, Battlefront is going to take some heat for this, and I feel they may have spent too much of their resources creating the smaller maps and game modes when they could have created more Walker Assault. Seven or eight maps of Walker Assault would have certainly done the trick, and although you will eventually have more than that with the four planned DLCs, it's certainly not a huge amount of content for launch at a price point of $60, especially if fighter squadron and small infantry battles don't appeal to you. This is an issue that many AAA games suffer from nowadays, is not putting enough effort into the key game modes and instead bolstering their stats by tacking on throwaway modes that we could all live without. In my opinion, they could have scrapped Hero Hunt, Blast, Hero Battles, Droid Run, and possibly more in exchange for more Walker Assault, and I think they would have ultimately had a more pleasing array of content. Now for me personally, the $60 price tag is still worth it for Star Wars Battlefront. I've sunk 30 hours into the Alpha, Beta, pre-release event, and EA Access release, and I'm not getting tired of the gameplay. In fact, I find myself theory crafting about cool setups you could run with the right combinations of star cards. That being said, I'm a pretty big Star Wars fan and the stunningly accurate reproductions of Endor and Hoth 
carry a lot of weight with me. The price point is really for you to judge for yourself and hopefully this review will allow you to decide. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to blasting some rebel scum. I'll see you guys next time. This is Level Cap, signing off.